Thank you for coming, everyone, and uh, welcome to Animal Tracking 101 for uh, learning to read and record animal tracks and sign in your nature journals and field notebooks. I'm Roseanne Hansen. Uh, as I said, Soraya is going to be assisting me. And so if you have questions through, throughout, just pop them into the chat, please. And Soraya is going to keep track of that. Ha <laughs> ha, that I did not intend that pun. <laughs> uh, so she will um, keep track and I'll pop in and, and she'll let me know if there's, there's anything going on. Something that can really help if you have a specific a question rather than, you know, if you, if you type an observation, that's great. If you type a question, Please um, put a Q in front of it with a, you know, a dash or something, a capital Q. That way, when we're looking, we can quickly see the questions amongst some of the chat chat. So uh, that would be wonderful. So what we're going to do today is I'm going to give a presentation and uh, interactive, you know, I'll be doing a lot of, of demonstrating and I'll be asking you what you think things are as we learn through. So that's why the chat's going to get kind of busy. Uh, then I'm going to swap then toward the end, um, doing demos on different ways that I've uh, learned and developed to uh, record tracks and um, also capture them, literally. So it's a lot of fun. All right, so if everyone can make sure they are muted now, that would be fantastic. And also when I'm giving the presentation, using a lot of bandwidth. Could you please turn off your videos? That really helps my recording quality, I've found. And then when we come back for Q&A at the end, please, um, you, you can turn your videos back on. But for right now, turn your videos off. And Soraya, as new people come on, if you could please um, turn their videos off, I won't be able to see chat or do anything while I'm giving the presentation. So, make sure I've got everything here. Yes, and so we're going to get started. Um, all right, I'm Roseanne Hansen. I am the Art and Science Program Coordinator for the University of Arizona's Desert Laboratory on Tumamoc Hill, and I run my own Field Arts Institute at exploringoverland.com, and I'm the author of Nature Journaling for a Wild Life. I've been an author, explorer, naturalist, and conservation uh, leader for well over 35 years. And so how did I get started uh, tracking wildlife? Well, besides the fact that you know, I, I studied ecology and evolutionary biology in college, and I've always been a naturalist, in the late 1990s, I became the first executive director of a regional conservation organization called Sky Island Alliance. The Sky Islands are the mountain ranges in the American Southwest and Northern Mexico that are you know, quite tall and large and they rise up out of the seas of grassland and desert. And this was a new organization and I helped to build uh, one of the very first citizen science wildlife tracking programs. We used this program with hundreds, uh, we had 700 people by the third year, uh, tracking wildlife and demonstrating how wildlife like mountain lions, black bears that live in the mountains, use the valleys to transit between mountains. And in, when we first started, uh, one of our goals, of course, was to identify important corridors and to then advocate for uh, controlled development, keeping corridors open, and things like uh, overpasses or underpasses under major highways. It took 20 years, but one of the goals came true recently. Tucson, Northern Tucson Oro Valley adopted two, an underpass and a wildlife overpass as a direct result of the data that we collected at Sky Island Alliance and has continued to be collected. So that was super exciting. So I helped lead that effort and uh, teach the wildlife tracking classes. And then Jonathan and I, my husband, Jonathan, um, one of the outcomes is we've, we've written a lot of natural history books 
And one of them is an animal track book. So that was another great incentive to really get better at what we do. All right, well, let's talk about tracking, right? It is about learning to read the stories that wildlife leave in their passing. You might look at this blank dry wash, which is halfway between two major Sky Island mountain ranges in Southern Arizona and think, huh, there's nothing going on here. But because I can read the signs left by the animals in passing, this wash here had the tracks of all these animals, black bear, snake, deer, coyote, coatamundi, which is a raccoon-like animal, and mountain lion. So there's a lot going on. If you can just learn to read the signs that animals leave in their passing. So what does it take? So do you have to be like Daniel Boone and be this grizzled tracker and, and, and have only secret powers? Absolutely not. We all have what it takes to learn to track animals. There are three basic skills. So those skills are the powers of patience. And I'll be talking more about these. The, the ability to be patient, the power of observation, and awareness. So let's look at these and drill down for a minute. So patience means when you are studying a track scene or even an individual track, you've got to slow down. You've got to like ramp down and, and really focus. And if you're in a group and maybe you've gone out to specifically look for tracks, one of the things that's the hardest is for people to actually not chit chat and talk because when you're engaging your mouth, part of your brain is not working and it's really hard to absorb the whole track scene. If you're chitty chattering about, you know, you know, some gossip you heard or whatever. You use all your senses if you're studying a track scene. And you're not just your sight, but you're going to listen for clues just around you. You're going to maybe smell, is there a, a a smell of a, a rotting carcass because a carnivore had killed something nearby, uh, things like that. You wanna be thorough. <laughs> and I'll just remind you when you're tracking, you want to slow down and close your mouth so that all your other senses can engage. So the power of observation means you need to look at the whole scene, not just the tracks. So that picture that I've got there, I'll be talking about that later and how we read that scene. So you're looking for things like, what did the animal do? Where did it come from? Where was it going to? How fast was it going? When do I think it, it, it passed? You know, how old are the tracks? And I'll talk a little bit about, about how you estimate age. And then this is a really important one. Look truthfully. It's so easy to make the track what you want it to be rather than what it really is. And I did this, um, you know, I have never seen a, a Mexican gray wolf or a Mexican gray wolf track. They're reintroduced here in Arizona and New Mexico. And in central Arizona, I was there in wolf country and I really wanted to turn this track into a wolf track, but it wasn't, it was a dog track, um, probably a domestic dog, big one, but you know, I had to be honest. And then awareness. So that means being aware of your environment. Um, where are you? What is the natural history around you? What is the, what are the biomes? What are the, are you in desert? Are you in grassland? Are you in a mountain? What kind of mountain? What animals live there? Knowing things like that will help you zero in on what species are there and help you with your identification. So, you know, seasonality, when are you there? Is it spring? Is that animal even there in the spring? Um, what's going on? The habitats I talked about, you know, what, what life zone are you in? And the weather too, what's going on? You might observe something that was maybe weather dependent, say a big rain event. So we know there's a, a big pool of water now over, you know, in a desert area. So maybe there's a lot of wildlife moving into that, um, 
to go drink from that pond. All right, zeroing in now on what, what is a track? What are we looking at? So you have the actual definition is, it's a depression left in the earth by some action, walking, a tail dragging, a belly dragging if it's a snake, um, or digging or something like that. And the parts of that are, so when something depresses into the earth, it displaces earth. And that's what creates the tracks. So you're looking at, there's a true track, the bottom floor where the pad of, of the animal's foot landed, pushing the dirt out. And then the outer wall is, is the outer track, the, the overall track, but that's not the true track that we measure. So we'll be looking at what that looks like uh, when we look at all the different tracks. So some brief anatomy. I'm going kind of high level here. We're not, you know, this is normally you, when you learn tracking really deeply, it takes days and days. You can a week long workshop because you have to study everything, you know, down to and including physiology of animals. So the anatomy of a track are when I say digits, I mean toes. And when I say plantar pad, that's kind of the heel pad of, of some animals. So we'll be talking about that. So you'll want to learn that nomenclature, toes, digits, and plantar pad. And what we measure is the width of the track, the true track, and the length of the true track. And I'll be demonstrating how, how we do that. You also, if you're, you're, you've got a, a cat or a dog track or a bear track, you wanna also measure the width of their plantar pad because that is diagnostic for many of the cats. We also talk about gait, which is how animals move, literally front foot you know, two front feet or front feet, back feet. Let's look at what that means or what the different types are. So here's some basic types of gates. You'll hear the term double register or direct register, a diagonal trot and bounding. So let's look at double register. So that means the animal puts its front foot down first and then the rear foot of the same side goes right over that front foot track. The animals that do this are, are felines and prey animals. Dogs can do it sometimes too. So what that means is they put that front foot, oops, oh, I hit the wrong key. Okay, oh, sorry about that. Okay, now we got the right key. They put a front foot down and then the rear foot goes over it. And then the next front foot, and then the rear foot goes over it. Front, rear, front, rear. And sometimes it's directly, and sometimes it's offset. We'll talk, I'm gonna talk about why in just a moment. So diagonal trot, dogs do this really frequently, especially foxes, horses do it. And what that is, is you've got a, a, a across the animal's body, the right and rear foot are in sync. So these make contact, these make contact, these make contact, and it's trot, 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 trot. If you've seen how, you know when puppies run and they kind of do that thing where their butt comes out and they oversteer, you know, that's a diagonal trot. So they're, they're, it does look like they're moving down kind of sideways. And then let's look at bounding, which is rabbits and Jumping mice, the way they walk or bound, and they put the front feet down. Sometimes it's one front foot, then the next one, or it's both together. And then the back feet come over and they, they hop, they bound, boink, front, boink, front, boink. Now, why are these gates like this? So let's look at why would you think double register or direct register is a useful gate? 
put that in the chat. Let's get some guesses going because um, it's an interesting reason. Okay, so if you guessed that if you're a predator and you're hunting something and you put your front foot down and you've looked and you know that you know there isn't like a twig or a leaf that's gonna go snap. If your rear foot comes and goes in exactly that same place, you know it's gonna be quiet too. It's a very efficient way to move quietly. Um, so a deer do it too. From the oh, yeah. So yes, yeah. Um, was there a question? No, we had some answers from your question from the chat that it makes them more silent. Um, that was from Kathy Bauman. Deborah Kahn said that it helps them sneaking up on prey. Great. Frank Castor has said for speed, um, to increase the speed of an animal was from Shirley Andrews. Fantastic. Uh, okay. Jack Tattersall said is double registered quieter. Dorothea Malspa said it confuses the prey. Jet Jose Sands said to avoid following the track. And Gretchen said minimize spot seen. So we've, we've been having some comments. That's great. That's great. So it's, it's definitely more efficient and, and a silent way to move. Diagonal trot is just super efficient. An animal can move long distances. Um, with the diagonal trot, it's very energy efficient. So coyotes use it a lot um, and foxes, as I said. And then bounding is another efficient you know, evolutionary gait as well. Um, and you'll see these tracks in a bit. So great guessing everybody. Now looking at what types of tracks, there's dig digitigrade, which are the canines, foxes, coyotes, wolves, dogs, the felines, bobcats, mountain lions, lynx, jaguar, and prey species, deer, javelina, and antelope. So digitigrade means literally they're walking on their toes from a morphological standpoint. Plantigrade is the other type, humans, bears, skunks, raccoons and raccoon-like animals called coatis. They walk on, you know, plantar style. They're, they use the heel pad. So I'm gonna really emphasize this and we, we really emphasize this for our tracking programs. Um, there is nothing that is absolute. So if I say cat tracks are often round, I say often because I'm gonna show you how other tracks can also, dog tracks can appear round. Um, so rules are relative, be cautious in your identifications. And I al almost always say usually, often, commonly, um, unless I'm absolutely sure where I saw the animal make the track. And I, it, I've been doing this long enough, I can, I can really be, be sure about mountain lions, for example. So feline tracks, let's look at that. And I have some handouts for you guys too. So this is gonna be in the handouts as well. Writing it down is a good idea because it's gonna help you remember, but I do have some handouts for you. So a feline track, so the wild cats or even your house kitty, um, will show four toes. The track itself is round overall and the toes tend to be round. The plantar pad is relatively large to the track. And there's often a C-shaped ridge above the plantar pad where the dirt's been pushed up by the step. And the way you can remember that is C for cat. Often shows three equal lobes at the bottom of the pad. And then the arrangement within the toe structure and the pad is what we call asymmetrical. And this is a great diagnostic. So you take a ruler or just imaginary line, uh, something you can even do it imaginary, draw a line up the edges of the plantar pads and it makes an X. And in an asymmetrical track, 
the top of the X's intersect the toes and it's not a perfect X, it's offset. And then on cats, there's often a leading toe, just like us, we have a leading finger. So a leading toe. And if you draw a line across the top of the toes, they're not, they don't usually line up with each other. They're asymmetrical. So there's a perfect mountain lion track. Now, what's interesting about this is because it's in soft sand and made a perfect impression. You can see the, the three lobes distinctly, see how even they are. That is super cat. Here's that C-shaped ridge of earth. And this is a really fresh track because see how crisp the edges are? Yes, it's, it's damp, but it hasn't had time to degrade or uh, it gets really, really, you can almost see the, the texture of the animal's pad here. And then, you know, I said round toe, and that's how it often prints, but since this is really deep, it actually shows the shape of the toe, which is more oblong. But often in a cat track, it's just gonna, gonna be just the pad of the, the toe. So blink, and so it looks more round. So again, remember I said, often round, but not always. And that's overall a very round track. Now looking at canine, four toes um, print, Remember they have the fifth, but it's a you know now evolved back a dew clock kind of thing. Um, the overall shape is very much more oval, and you often get more oval toes. The plantar pad is often much smaller in relation to the overall track in wild canines, because I'm going to look at dogs too, uh, domestic dogs. Um, there's often claws printing but not always. Um, remember that in a lot of places, say Southern Arizona or in deserts, you know, the Mojave or whatever, coyotes that live there, they work hard for a living. It's very um, abrasive substrate. So their toe, toenails actually wear down a lot. So they don't, I don't see a lot of coyote toenails in the American Southwest. In the mountains, a little bit more, but that's just you sometimes diagnostic but not always. So don't say, you know, oh, dogs always have claws. Um, the bottom lobes are two to three print and they're, they're unequal. So they're not that perfect triple lobe. And then if you draw a line uh, along the edges of the plantar pad on each side, it makes almost a perfect X. And in fact, there's a ridge of dirt that comes up as the toes pinch in because of the symmetry uh, that creates an X in dirt, dirt. And see how if you draw a line across the toes, they're often perfectly lined up. So that creates this perfect little X relationship. So one way to remember that is X marks, marks spot marks, the X marks the spot, spot marks the X, right? Because dogs like to mark things. There's a perfect coyote track. You see that um, if we draw the line there, it's very symmetrical. It makes a really nice, perfect X. There's the toenails, oblong toe pads, and a smaller plantar that doesn't have triple lobe. So deer have twin sections. So do um, animals called javelina, which are pig-like animals. They're actually in their own family, Tessuidae. Um, and here in the Southwest, South America, Central America, Mexico. Um, and they're, they're heart-shaped as well. They often have a deeper impression at the front because that's where they're walking, you know, literally walking on their toes. And they often show the gait is double, double register which can be hard, double register can be tricky. So bears, skunks, kawadis, kawadamundi are in the raccoon, same um, procyonidae, the, the family with um, raccoons. Um, so they show five toes. 
And the rear plantar pad is long, like a foot, like a human foot. And they have different front and rear tracks. There's a front track of a bear, five toes, and then a smaller, not elongated plantar pad. All right, now we're going to try some IDs. So everybody take a moment and Whenever I do photos of tracks, I try to put in a ruler or something for scale if I don't have a ruler with me, because otherwise it's just almost worthless if you don't have scale. So judging by this, what are we seeing? We are seeing, look at that lovely heart shape. It's two parts. On many animals, pretty much most, um, that walk digitigrade, walk on their toes. The front foot is larger than the rear foot. And why do you think that is? So let's think about that. The picture yourself walking on four, all fours. You've got these shoulders and this massive head. <laughs> Heads are heavy. Um, way up here, up here, up at the front. So your front feet need to be, have, be a bit bigger to handle all the weight. So cats, dogs, they're, they're, they generally have bigger four feet. So do deer. So yes, this is a deer. This is a white-tailed deer, smaller in the American Southwest. Um, this is the coos white tail. Pretty little girl. All right, let's, let's practice this one. So what are we seeing here? I'm saying, seeing round overall, yeah. And, hmm, is everybody else seeing what looks like a nice C shape there? Now, this is really gritty dirt and I'm not seeing three lobes, but I'm seeing pretty big plantar pad. And if I draw lines along the sides of the pads, I get an asymmetrical relationship. And then size-wise, I didn't have a ruler, but this is a lens cap um, from an SLR. So that's about two and a half, three inches. So that's about the size of, what do you guys think? Yes, that's a bobcat track. Uh, a South American Southwest, Northern Mexico species of just about all like the cats, the bobcats, mountain lions, um, Mexican wolves. They're smaller, the deer, the coos white-tailed deer are, are slightly smaller than, than their counterparts in the North. So Northern coyotes are much bigger um, and Eastern. And in parts of California, bobcats are bigger. Um, so keep that in mind. You wanna have your ID books handy that, that differentiate. All right, let's, let's look at this one. So stare at this for a bit. I'm seeing one, two, and then this looks like a double register in here. So this is like super hard to uh, identify. So we're gonna go with looking at this one and this one. So what are we seeing? We're seeing the winged lobe, the triple lobe, but it's not even. There's, there's it's showing three, but these are shorter. And relative to the track, it's pretty compact and small. They're over, oval overall. That's a tongue twister. And if we draw the X, it's very symmetrical. I'm gonna erase the X for a minute and stare at the X's and then you'll see the X ridge on the ground. Look at that. It's like, bang. Whoops, okay, one more time. There and back, ha, it's really interesting. So X marks the spot, spot marks the X, and we have a coyote track. Now, there's, didn't, didn't um, impress claw marks at all, maybe right there. I'd have to get my nose right down on it to look. So that's not always diagnostic. Let's try another. All right, what are we seeing here? Well, interesting, you can see the difference between the front and the rear. And I'm seeing ovals, but look how round that is. Hmm. Hmm. 
wow, it almost looks like triple lobe. That's hard, but I would have to study all of them to see, well, look at that X there. And these are showing symmetry as well. This, this has symmetry as well. So even though this looks pretty round, huh? So I see claw, a little bit of claw marks, not a lot. So is this a coyote? Because it certainly was out in an area where there were coyotes. But actually, I put this in to demonstrate. No, it's actually a domestic dog. This was our border collie. And he throws a track through a track that was really looked like coyote because um, despite um, what he's doing here illegally on our sofa, um, he occasionally worked cattle and uh, we went trail running a lot. So when you have a border collie, you have to go running a lot. And um, so he wore his claws down. He didn't have what is more typical like this. This is a typical dog track, domestic dog. I call it sloppy. There's a lot of claw, there's a lot of splay. They're not in good shape usually. Some of them are overweight. So use that, think about that when, when, you're, when you're looking at tracks. Where are you? Are there humans and dogs present? Um, if you're way in the wilderness, it's unlikely to be domestic dog. So back to that awareness. What habitat are you in? What do you expect to see there? Um, you always want to keep, keep that in the back of your mind. That said, you know, if you looked at this from straight on, um, you know, some people could think, oh, that might be a, a mountain lion. But you would look more at the behavior, the fact that there were human prints right next to it. It's probably not a cougar stalking a human. So use all of your awareness, habitat knowledge. All right, this is a hard one um, because it barely left an impression because it's small. Look at how, how small that is. Um, this is the track. It actually overstepped a, something there, but this is the main track that, that showed. Yeah, it's, it's definitely more oval. And that little pad there looks like it has an, an A. It's not the triple lobe symmetry there. So when I draw the line in there, oh gosh, that's, that's probably a dog, isn't it? But what? It's that small. Um, and what would be here? This is in Southern Arizona. So this is a fox called a gray fox. Um, red foxes are introduced from Europe and they're not in our area, but those of you in other parts of America do have red foxes, they're a little bigger. And their um, tracks look like this, they're really interesting. So um, very tiny little plantar pads that sometimes barely even show just a little wing um, on, bo on, on both. So you'll get these tiny little dots. And I've never seen a fox uh, claw print. All right, it's the next one. I accidentally touched that a little soon. But um, all right, let's diagnose this. Well, first of all, where am I? Well, we are in the Arctic on the um, edge of the uh, Barents Sea, Bering Sea, and uh, on our way to Takatayaktuk. And what are we seeing here? What is the shape? I know this is an oblique angle. This is oval. And see how symmetrical, if I'm looking there, and if I draw the, X, the, <laughs> the uh, lines along the plantar pads, it's very much an X. And so we know where we are, there are wolves. So this is what wolf tracks look like. Which is the front? the larger one and the rear. So that was that, you know, supporting the big, that wolf had shoulders power. There's a lot of muscles and weight up there. How about this one? I think I'm seeing five toes, two, three, four. There's an impression in there, but there's a lot of rocks there. And maybe same with this one, one, two, three, four, five. And this looks like a human foot, doesn't it? And it's big. So I'm pretty confident saying 
This is the black bear. And other sign that bears leave, this is kind of fun. Um, we'll look at a few other signs, um, but they, they like to rub on signposts and trees and they scratch them as well, or they might be pulling the bark down to get at some bugs. But this is showing um, where hair from a bear um, got stuck on a post where it rubbed and this is uh, scratch marks. So you carry rulers and things so you can do photos that have um, a, a good scale on them. That really helps. All right, let's figure out what this one is. There's five toes. One, two, three, four, five. There's claws showing for sure. And it looks like a longer pad here, though it was really walking on its toes there, but this is definitely shorter. It looks like a little human hand, but let's, let's look at scale. So I didn't put a, a ruler in here, but that's a coyote print. So it's a little smaller, eh, around, well, let's just say around the same size as a, a coyote. And then again, look at where you are. I wanna keep drawing us back out. Where are you? What could be here? So this is by water. So that helps me determine by the shape and everything that I've got a raccoon track, which is really fun. Looks like little human hands. All right, now what do we have here? So Remember the bounding gate to uh, hind feet and to four, four feet. So yes, this was a cottontail rabbit in the snow in Southern Arizona. And which direction do you think it's heading? Okay, if you said from left to right, you are correct. Because remember they put their four feet down and then the hind feet come over. And they have a lot of fur between their toes, but their toe, their feet are really pointed on the end. So they, they come together like this. So that helps point the direction. Now, here's a little tiny track that kind of looks like the raccoon track because there's five toes two, three, four, five, and a little pad there, but look how small it is. A little over inch, like inch and a quarter. And remember our, our species that, that walk like that and have feet like that, it's a skunk. And if you really do this for a long time, you might even be able to guess the species by the size, but there are like five, I think five species in our area. So that would be kind of hard. All right, let's look at this one. What the heck is this? And so the first thing you would do, you're like, where are you? Um, if you're in Africa, is this an elephant track? Look at how big it is. Yeah, but it's kind of weird, you know, the way it's displaced. But we're not in Africa. So we're in Southern Arizona. So what would make a track like this? Let's <laughs> see if we've got some good guessing. And this was cool because this is the actual animal that left this track uh, because we were able to see it before it left. This is a, a diamondback rattlesnake and it's hunting, that's its hunting mode. So that's really cool. They, they scooch down and create these, these circular depressions. It's really cool. So what do you think? This tells even more of a story, doesn't it? So what this is, it's a snake entering from the right and it coiled up and hunted. And this was in the middle of the night when they're hunting. And then it exited. Don't know if it got anything, I doubt it, or it would be a lot more um, uh, torn up probably. If it got something, then it would, would, would probably make a bit of a mess. 
Um, it, it really, you can just tell where it settled in and then slowly left, pushing the dirt with its belly. So that's a fun one. Okay, now these are real instructive because these are the next slides are gonna show lots of different variety. And so we're, we're getting a bit more advanced here. Well, what are we seeing here? Well, I think the obvious thing here is that strong triple lobe plus the big pads. Here's a big pad. I see one, two, three, four toes in here. If you stare at it long enough, you'll see it. I see four toes here. And I'm seeing that C-shaped ridge of dirt here. Yes, so that is a classic mountain lion track. Also look at the size. So we're looking at one, two, three, four, five, probably seven to eight centimeters. Okay, so we've got a participant using a, an iPad. I don't know how to turn that off, but Josh's um, the iPad movements are, are showing on my screen. I have no idea how to turn that off. If someone does, maybe help Soraya figure that out. Um, I don't know how to turn that off. So let's look at some more. All right. Here's a fantastic impression of a plantar pad with three strong lobes. The toe didn't print too well, but holy cow, look at that. And look at the size. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, about six centimeters across on the pad. So that's a fairly large um, mountain lion. This is a mountain lion here. What about this one though? Hmm, I see claws, definite claws. And, huh. Wow, this, this is kind of oblongy, isn't it? And, huh. But then I'm gonna study that a little bit more. And I'm gonna go, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is asymmetrical. And it was sliding in the mud. So, hmm, it probably was like, whoa, 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 whoa. And its toes came out and got a little bit of claw action there. So, and the size, look at the size. It's not a coyote. There's no wolves in this area yet. So these are both mountain lion. So look at the difference there. Substrate counts, sliding, squishing. You know, cats are just like we are. If you start slipping, you're going to go whoa and grip. So that's going to show quite a different track than the one in the sand where he's just like cruising along. Let's look at this. What do you think the one here is? And I'm, you know, definitely throwing in some weird ones. What is that? Is that a dog? Certainly not huge. It could be a dog. Not enough information here. And that's often, you know, tracks aren't always perfect. So um, I can't really tell. But I can, I can give you some clues um, that we did see other tracks near this and what this was. And I didn't show them kind of on purpose, but this was a mountain lion, but it, it was running. Maybe it was being chased, maybe it was going after something, but it left, uh, it dug in and it was, it was moving fast. Um, here's more lion tracks. And you can see that how close together the front and rear tracks are. This is a double register here. This is a double register here. So this is not quite double register. These tracking rulers, and actually I've got a, I'm gonna give you a, a free PDF um, where you can make your own tracking ruler like that because they're quite handy. Because you can turn them on the L like this to put it for scale. Now, ha, this is super advanced, this is hard. What do we think we're seeing here? Just stare at it. 
you know, and it's okay if you say, I don't see anything at all. <laughs> nope. Because I've been, you know, working with animals in this region for a very long time. So I can just quickly go bink and I see the impression. So don't, don't feel bad if you don't see anything at all. What is here are three strong lobes. There's your C-shaped ridge. It's pretty crisp. This is this is fairly fresh because it hasn't had time to sort of degrade since that's actually sand that's going to degrade pretty quickly. And there's the mention of toes, but it is on top of another track. So here's the other track remnant, the three lobes right there. So you're going to get, because that's a remnant of a track, then the, this part is going to be really sloppy. So you're not going to get super perfect toes probably. So really cool track there. So that's, that's another mountain line. Again, look at the size. If you measure the, the pad across here, it's about four and a half centimeters. And then the whole thing is about um, seven, eight centimeters. So that's a medium sized line uh, for the American Southwest. All right, now we're gonna get into reading the stories, which is fun um, because other things happen. So what's happening here? Well, on the upper left, there's clear claw marks that my fingers are showing exactly where the claws are in that. And then scritches all the way around. Now, where am I? I'm in the Babakivri Mountains in Southern Arizona. So I know there aren't bears here. What animal is that big with toes that'll be that far apart, which is gonna scratch just like a cat? Yes, even the big cats behave just like your kitty cats at home. They scratch to keep their claws, sheaths cleaned and, and sharp. I don't know if it sharpens, but it pulls the, the you know, it's like dead uh, stuff around it, cleans off the blood and stuff. Um, what else? So the other two on the lower left, that arrow is showing, those are toe marks of earth pulled back. And if you put your nose down at the top of those mounds, it smells like urine. And same with on the right. Those are toe marks pulling a mound of dirt up. And right on top of that was a scat. Just like your kitty cat at home, the bigger cats also scrape up dirt and deposit on top of it. Now, our cats do the opposite. These guys are piling up dirt and depositing on top to elevate the scent. This was a scent station. This is really cool. We actually lived, um, we were naturalists at Buenos Aires National Wildlife Refuge for a few years and lived in a very remote canyon, just us. And we ended up identifying, getting to know that we were in the home territory of a single female lion. And this was her marking. And one day we noticed there was lots of mark. This is a marker post for her, lots of marking. And then the next day we saw her with a male and we heard her classic mating scream. So our friends who came to visit um, months, months later got to see the kittens, but we did not. Um, so very curious there. So that's a, a lion sign. Bobcats do this too. Here's another story. So here we are walking at one of our transects where we were studying what animals use this corridor on this wash in Southern Arizona between mountains. And we came upon this. Wow. You know, first of all, you're like, oh my goodness, what is that dark stuff? And there's actually a lot of fur right hair here. And yeah, this is blood and it's somewhat dried. And if you look here, this is a drag mark in the earth. And if you follow the direction of the drag mark into those bushes, that's what we found. So that was a deer that had been killed by a mountain lion. 
and partially covered and the lion was probably off resting. Um, it had probably, it had eaten the yummy bits and in, in the opened up the, the um, cavity and eaten that part already. And then it's gonna come back over days and days and finish up as much as it can. So really cool. And you wanna be situationally aware. You know, we made sure that the lion wasn't around and it, it probably was, but it was probably just watching us from afar. But um, there were three of us in this group. Really cool story, right? We found a number of these um, drag marks and stashed kills. Roseanne? Yeah. We have a question if you have a moment. Absolutely. Cheryl T wanted to know, do mountain lions scratch to mark territory? So they, they scratch to leave scent marking. So yes, um, what we figured was um, when that female le, uh, marked in her little signpost, we called it a signpost area, she was probably leaving a scent that indicated she was um, in estrus, that she was ready to breed. And um, the male would come by the male, there were several males who abutted her territory and they all marked at different points. And so that was a communication station. So yes, they definitely use it to communicate, to communicate territory, communicate the readiness for breeding um, and so forth. So really interesting. Does that, I hope that answered the question. Yeah, I did. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, so here's another story. This is wild. So driving back to Brown Canyon in the wildlife refuge, you know, if we weren't aware, we could have driven right by this and totally missed it. But it, it just like leaped out at us. Look at all these tracks. I mean, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 12, 13, 40, 15, 16, like, like, there's like 30 or 40 tracks in here. And we started looking very carefully. We went slowly. We didn't jabber, you know, we were taking photos. We were studying. Jonathan and I were like uh, you know, throwing out ideas and we just walked around and around this whole area going out in circles and studying. And what we determined based on the fact that all the tracks were aged the same, so, they weren't an animal that came through one time and then another animal. We were pretty sure these were all at the same time. Pretty sure, right? We can't be 100% sure. Um, and then there were some smaller ones and bigger ones. And so what we know of the natural history of mountain lions is occasionally females will congregate. Probably it's a daughter uh, relative who had gone off and her territory is maybe next door or nearby and they've got young and there's been um you'll find some some papers and and verified sightings by by researchers that i think in colorado they had like 14 lions in one area all at once and there were photos um and it was females with their young and they're probably related and we think that's might be what we were seeing here you know, we don't think it, males don't hang out with the females and the females, um, they're young, they can have two, sometimes three, two is more common, one's common, um, but, but they'll stay with mom for a couple of years at least before they're ready to go off and be adult lions. Now, here's a fun story. And this is where you really get to know your region and you, you, you gotta learn what's there, what's going on around you and read the sign that we're seeing here. So, I mean, first thing I was like, okay, where were we? We were in Southern Arizona. We were actually with a group, we were, were bringing a group of a donor to look at the region um, when we were starting to study um, big cats in the area and one of the things we were studying was the presence of, just started in Southern Arizona, the presence of jaguars coming up from, from Mexico. This was in, in the mid 2000, like 2010, 11. And so 
here we are with this donor and we're at this cattle pond and I think we this mountain lion, but the guy we were with, who is an expert tracker, it's actually a mountain lion hunter. When he saw this track, he just went, boing, 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 boing. look at this. That's a lion track for sure. And this scale, I have it pretty much the same. This is quite a bit bigger. And look at the re relationship of that pad to those toes and the size. Wow, it's so much bigger size-wise. And again, that pad taking up a huge part of the, the paw. And we were, I wanna say 90% certain that that was a Jaguar track. And in fact, we were pretty certain it was this Jaguar, uh, Macho B. He was in the region. We knew he was in the region, he was being studied, and that's a Jaguar track for sure. So we're pretty certain that was a Jaguar track and that it was Macho B, who lived in Arizona for 13 years. He was seen many times on cameras. He was recorded in, in, in Brown Canyon where we lived um, back in the, the late 90s by these, these uh, uh, lion hunters. And we think we also heard him roaring one night. So pretty cool. Sadly, Macho B was killed by game and fish researchers who snared him and left him snared. They were going to put a radio collar on a 13 year old Jaguar and um, they snared him and he was left on the snare too long. And he, he, he died of, of the complications from the wounds he received. So very upsetting. So, but to more positive things, um, let's talk about how we can record tracks and then I'm gonna do some demos because um, these are fun. So you're out, you find a track. So one of the cool ways to do it, a plexiglass sheet, um, with a dry erase and you elevate it and you directly trace the track. And this is a great exercise because what that does is making you um, really study what that track looks like. I mean, you're, you're intimately tracing it. So you get to know those lobes, you get to know the toes, you get to know all these tracks. Great exercise. And you can, I'll show you two different ways you can transfer that to your journal. Another way is carry plaster and I'll show you how I do that. And you can pour a plaster cast um, and have an actual impression of the track. That's the Jaguar track. This is Catherine Hilker, one of the world's foremost philanthropists for cat conservation. She founded, she was the, the funds behind the Cheetah Conservation Fund and the Cincinnati Zoo uh, Cheetah Breeding Program. And we took her to Southern Arizona to get her interested in the Jaguar program, which she did support. And so we gave her the, the track. And then ways to put it in your journal. We will, um, I'll show you some of these ways here. You can do stippling, dot, dot, dot. That's a great way to, to show the impression of what a track looks like in the ground. Always remember to put your measurements Let's look at here. This is a wild dog in Botswana. Look at the measurements, how close they are to a Southern Arizona mountain lion. So that's, that's just great knowledge that, that, that you have. But if you don't put your measurements in, it just doesn't mean anything. So curious, isn't it, how close they are? Um, there's other ways to do it in, in watercolor. Like this was in the snow, so I chose to use, you know, purpley blue color to show that. Um, and here is in mud and, you know, I wanted to make sure I showed kind of the impression, but the fact that it was in mud with little, little germinate, germinating annuals in there, that was neat. And then I'll show you how I do this fun. This is not to scale. Obviously there aren't, you know, giant quail the size of coyotes, but this is a, a fun way to use a wax resist to create a track trail in your journal. And I'll show you how to do that. 
And then if you're in a place where you can do this, say you're camping somewhere or you've got an area uh, near your home where you know there's a lot of, of wildlife um, and, and it's not gonna be disturbed too much by other people, um, you can literally make a runway with a board, you know, just run the board down until it's nice and smooth and then keep checking it. And then you've got some really nice track impressions. Um, that's, that's just a fun exercise. And then use those ways that I'll show you for recording the tracks in your journals. And then this is, I'll have this handout for you. It's actually, you can print it out double-sided and cut it out. It's like a little bookmark. The sizes are for the Southwest US and Mexico, but I did put a note on there for you that um, just extrapolate if you're not in the region um, that there's, there's larger, the, the species are a little larger in other areas. So the track sizes are not correct, but you can get the shapes and the tips on there. So that we'll put that in the chat as well. There's a link to download. And I'm also going to be, um, uh, recording the, this is being recorded and um, I'll put this on a, my tutorial site with all the links and downloads. And so you'll have access to this, don't worry. So, okay, so that was fun. So any specific questions I should handle now, Soraya, before I jump into some demos? We do have one question from Carla McCann. How do elks track, how do elk tracks compare to deer as far as shape? Ah, good question. Yeah, I couldn't cover every animal and I have um, less experience with the elk, but they're, they're, their elk are, look more like cow tracks in that they're a little bit more separated. They are pointy in, but they're not super sharp heart shape like the deer and they're they're big right so uh, there are, I, we're going to put some resources at the end some really good books to to we suggest for um, the track measurement styles there's some fantastic books um, Paul Resendez um, tracking in the art of seeing is one of my favorite tracking books period so that's fantastic so um, any anything else Uh, so far, those are the only questions. Okay, great. So what we're going to do now is head over to my document camera. Okay. Let me just make sure we're here. Yes. Okay. Makes a funny noise. Okay. All right, so what I'm going to do next is I'm going to show you some of those plaster casts. So this is a, is a cast done in the wild. This is actually an African lion. And you see how, how cool that came out. And it just really gives you the size and you can see the, the lobes and what a great, great thing to to have. So we've got a, a collection of tracks from all over. This is someone made this for a fundraiser, but it is a, a Jaguar track. And so they made it by taking one of these, a really good one from mud, and then they, they created um, plaster impressions of this to create these to sell for a fundraiser, but it's a great, great thing to have. Again, it shows, see how huge the pad is um, in a Jaguar track and the three lobes and the round ear toes and no claws. So the first thing we're going to do though is I'm going to do, let's do a, a tr we're gonna do tracing and transfer now. In my journal, I keep in the back this clear Perspex palette that I was telling you guys about. We actually developed these, these Perspex sheets for the tracking. 
and you use a dry erase marker. So I, this, this palette I use, I put my, my paint kit on here. So there it's, it's magnetic. I stick that in my journal. So it's my palette, but it does other things too. I keep a ruler clipped to it for measuring things. I'm gonna take it off for this though. Now, there are a couple of ways we can use this to trace a track. Mr. Lyon's going to go away here. And I'm going to use this to demonstrate. Now, if I were in the wild, I would put, um, I would put, you know, I'd raise this up. You don't set it right on the track or it's going to ruin the track. So I would elevate that up. So here's the quick and, quick and dirty way. Oops, do not want to accidentally use a Sharpie on your plastic. So dry erase. And then you want to get, you want to get directly over, over it. So I can't really do that here and demonstrate exactly, but I want to get that true track. So this is showing that, see the two, there's the, the true track and this is the lateral ridge. We want the true track. So I want to get down here. I'm going to hold it steady. And I'm going to try trace that in there. there. That's pretty good. My head is not directly over it because my document camera is in the way. So, again, I'm doing the, the true track, not the, not the lateral ridge. All right, voila. Now, quick and dirty way to get this into your journal kind of a cheater way, is to put, have some just copy paper, printer paper in your journal, hold that there or um, clip it, get your Sharpie, and then hold this up to the sun and trace it. And then I would write in the measurements. So I would measure the track track. And I use generally use um, metric and holding it up so I don't destroy the track. I would say the overall width here is of the that is seven centimeters, which is pretty big. So that showing that. And then I would do the same here. Again, I want to be, I want to be like directly above. So there's no parallax. And sometimes I have to like do that. So I'm going to say total of 10 centimeters here. So, and this is Jaguar, Southern Arizona. And then I can just paste this in my journal. See how quick that was? Um, you know, if you wanted, you could go in and show some shading, get that C-shaped ridge up here. If you want, you don't obviously have to. Uh, just adds a little interest. 
like that. So you can just tape that or glue it onto your journal page. Now, there's another way to do it though, if you want to draw this directly on a journal page. Um, so we're going to erase this and do something else. First thing we're going to do is Here's my page. I'm, I'm out for a, so I'm out for a walk. Let's say, <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm going to draw a jaguar in my journal, so I'm not going to see the jaguar in the in on my walk. But I always do my metadata. I like you guys know I'm the metadata queen, right? Um, so I filled in today's metadata. Had my little moment of observation about what was going on in our yard this morning, and now I'm out. Now I'm out hiking, um, and I would put that location here. And I found this track, I found this track and I want it in here, but I don't wanna do this way. I wanna draw it directly in my journal. So I get a pencil and my ruler, I'm gonna do this over here. And I'm gonna draw a grid here and I, I've got the track, so I know the track is, I'm gonna make the grid a little larger than the track. So I'm gonna make the grid like, uh, like 13 centimeters. It barely fits in my journal. So what I'm doing, I'm using pencil because I'm gonna erase this. I'm gonna make it a square. I, I'm, I'm creating a drawing grid. That's not really a square, but you know what? It really doesn't have to be perfect because of this, the way I do this. I'm gonna roughly divide these into thirds here, here. It doesn't have to be perfect and I'll show you why in a sec. Um, the lines, you should use a ruler though, that's helpful. Okay, so there's my drawing grid. I take my trusty palette, my dry erase, not my Sharpie. Now, and turn it over. This is the back. This is the top on the back. And then I'm going to trace my grid. And this, I want, oops, I want to make sure it's pretty accurate. It has to match my, what's in my journal. Okay. Then, set this aside for the moment. Here's my track. Turn it over. Right, I've got my rocks or whatever that's holding it up. And then I'm going to draw my true track again. I go pretty fast on this one. <laughs> okay, pretty good. All right, back over there. And in my journal, I'll probably start with pencil in case I mess up. But I'm going to use the grid system to copy this by going square to square and it makes it so much easier. So let's start, do that line right there. All right, now let's do this line. Now let's do this line.
and this one. There. Ooh. Didn't quite get that right, did I? See, I can amend that a little bit. And then we've got this toe here. I'm going pretty rapidly, so we have plenty of time for, oops, got wobbly, um, for, for uh, other demos, but you kind of get the, the gist here, right? How I would use this. So, you know, I'm, I'm just, transferring what I'm seeing. It makes it so easy. Yeah. I'd probably adjust that just a little bit before I inked it in. And you would you would go and adjust and and then add your um, measurements, you know, the same way we did before, um, you know, seven centimeters. Um, I would ink it in, um, let's see. And there's lots of different ways to ink it in. Um, and then I would erase the, uh, the pencil. So a couple of different ways to ink it. Um, let's see, I think I'm gonna demonstrate the the inking part with some other other species rather than this one because this is a really big track and take me forever so we'll, we'll move along a little bit more um, but that is a really great way to transfer when you have like a really special cool track you want you don't want to lose um, and you want to get the exact proportions um, so erase that that's the cool thing these palettes I love um, so versatile for so many things. You can use it for um, for things like you can you know draw your viewing grid. Or if those of you have seen John Muir Laws, um, this is a little aside. How he does those super cool um, cube landscapes. You can create a cube and then hold it up in your landscape to actually capture something because you've drawn it in your book first. Super cool. So love that. Okay, so let's talk about other ways to color it in, uh, color in your track. So let's draw, let's draw a track, let's see. Well, um, yeah, let's do a wild dog track. I'm just going to do one wild dog. I might go, I'm going to do it in pencil first. So I'm going to do this one here. It's got more distinct lines. I'm going to freehand this one and I'm going to draw it down here. It's got a, a small lobe. It's just a small impression here at the bottom. And then kind of a, a real roundy toe there. And then see how close together the toes were on this track. That's the toe region, but the, the ridge of dirt actually creates this elongation here. Um, and again, we've got the symmetrical toe here. and another symmetrical toe here. Okay. 
but the way the, the ridges, the way the animal placed its foot, that X ridge popped up. So we have a, I wanna, I wanna capture that, the ridges. Like that, I uh, get my eraser out here. I'm gonna start inking this. Now, there's a couple of ways to ink. Um, we can use water-soluble ink. So I would maybe not use a, a like a very strong line. I would go ahead and use dots. So you can use ballpoint pen, um, whatever you've got on hand, just as if it's water soluble, um, give this Where's a little sh shading. Yeah, go ahead. We've had someone mention in the chat that they're having an issue seeing which track you're rendering. It's this one right here. Okay, we and can't tell which one you're pointing to. Oh, so it's not showing the cursor. Ah, that's one of the drawbacks. Um, it is. The one, okay, let me let me just make this bigger. Hold on. That one. Thank you. Okay, thanks for letting me know. Um, I didn't realize this program didn't show the um, that. So I'm I'm inking in here. So I'm trying to get that that shape. So there's a the, even though the toes are round, it actually these end up looking very teardrop shaped and I'm, I'm, I want to capture that. So that's why I'm using dots and then I'll erase the, um, the pencil. And then I'll show you what the, the, the water soluble. So what I'm trying to do is capture how that X really shows in these ridges. So you get that floral, floral, it's like a little florette. And then because it's water soluble, I can go in here. And create shading with a, a wet brush. So it really starts to pop off the page here. I could even, you know, if I oh, just get it barely, give it more color in the middle. And pretty soon, um, once once the water soluble ink dries after you've spread it like that, then it's pretty pretty solid. Um, so that's how I would. Now I can go in and erase once that's dry. Um, erase some of the, the pencil and keep giving it. I want to show that ridge even more. So I'm going to go dot, 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 dot. And then I'm not going to put water soluble. I'm not going to put water on, on that. I want to show that. Strong ridge that. Like so. And you can use different colors of ink. Um, say I wanted to, to make a track that was uh, 
you, I use, I like walnut ink, makes a really pretty brown track. So uh, let me just do, a, I'm just gonna do a free form. Well, I'll call up a mountain lion here, let's see. Um, do that, so I'm just gonna do this freehand. And again, you know, I would put the, don't forget to put the measurements here if I were out in the field. But so using my walnut ink, I'm going to do, it's going to be more sketchy. Because I'm, I'm freehanding it. And so This one has that leading toe. Now, this is the fun part about this walnut ink. I can go in, it's fairly water soluble. I mean, it's kind of like half and half and give it some, and then I'll go in with, um, while it's wet and I can add quite a bit more detail and end up with a really cool almost like you know da Vinci-esque colors here because he used one I think and that makes a really beautiful track in your notebook so real quick and easy ways to add a beautiful track now what if it were um, a if it were in the snow, then use um, use blue ink. I'm just going to do a it's a deer track in the snow. And if it's water soluble, it immediately gives the impression of being, you know, cold and in the snow, and um, it's deeper up here at the at the front. You know, I'm doing this in the damp, so it's nice. It's it. Um, blurs nicely. There. So that's how I would experiment with different colors too. You could use watercolor pencils, um, put some stippling. And keep working on that. And again, you know, you would put measurements. Now, one of the other fun tips that I really enjoy doing is using a resist. Um, there's a really fun way to do that. I mentioned this in the sign up. Go back over here. Let's say I want to draw a track trail. Like this. So this is um, lions in Kenya at a conservation um, area I was working at. And so there's this trail of uh, mama lion and baby lion tracks going down the road. So my hand is at the upper part of her, um, the two, two big tracks and then the little ones in between. And since we saw them, we knew that that, that was a baby and not like a, a serval or something that walked by later. So I can do, I'm gonna turn it sideways and I'm gonna run it this way. And how am I going to, okay. So here's, here's my tip, this is fun. Remember I mentioned waxed paper? So I keep these squares of waxed paper, I keep a, a uh, 
an envelope in my journal full of like wax paper and little glassine envelopes and things. So I've always got some wax paper with me. So not my wax paper. I always um, find, mark the top. The wax is only on one side. Mark the top. Um, always write top. I used to write, I, the first time I wrote T and um, of course T looks the same whether it's either way, so top. Um, and then make your drawing. I'm not going for a perfect drawing here. I want to tell the story. So I'm going to say, I'm going to draw with a, a dull pencil on the top of my, my uh, paper here. And I'm coloring it in. Scritching, I'm transferring that wax. Oh, somebody's mic is on. If we could check our mutes, please. Uh, did, did I get muted? You did. Oh, wow. Okay. I haven't touched the screen. So when, when did you lose me? Uh, just a few seconds ago. Oh, okay. Good. Phew. Okay. So I'm just coloring in and then I'm going to draw the baby tracks. Oh, so cute. And they're, they're, they're a lot more amorphous there because they have a lot of fur between their toes. So they're just kind of little blobbies. Still cat tracks, but there, this one over here. Yeah, they're definitely less distinct. There. And I might, maybe I put one up there. Um, just, just one baby track. Okay, then here's the fun part. Get my, uh, get my little watercolor minimalist kit here and refresh the colors. And let's kind of make some Kenyan dirt color here, I'm gonna cheat. Oops, that came up. A brown. Okay, I need a little bit more. And then in my journal, oh, I forgot a toe, ha. Huh? Um, you have to be, I was talking and um, I think I forgot to scribe a toe. So uh, you have to make sure you press really hard but you get a really nice, fun, yep, see, I didn't press hard enough on the other ones. So um, that is a fun way to get tracks into your journal um, using a wax resist. So this is going to dry, dry a little better. I think it'll pop out. 
I can add a little texture here. And you can, it's fun to do this with bird tracks and, and everything else too. So that's a fun way to, to get tracks in your journal. So let me switch now to, okay. Um, let's talk about um, these kits uh, and the, the plaster, how to do, how to do your, uh, your own plaster. Oh, one thing uh, before I move on to that, I just realized um, one thing you might want to journal are, is I've, I've been cutting these accordion pieces of larger paper. So say I wanted to do a bigger track story, I could glue this into my journal and do my story out here like that and then fold it in and you can glue or tape that in your journal. Say if this, this track story went, went way off the page and that's a really fun way to do that. I'm just loving these accordion. I, I, I cut these for maps for doing mapping in my journal, but it works great for other stuff too. All right. Now, if you wanna do plaster, so use this, this is a, a Nalgene um, tin or <laughs> container. Um, so it's hard, it's a polycarbonate. And then I keep plaster in a Ziploc bag, usually double bag have some spare Ziploc bags with you as well. And then, um, oh, that's leaking, huh? And then strips of paper that's, uh, so this is like cover stock paper, but it's shiny on one side, um, or both sides better. And cut, just cut strips and they, they live in there. So when you just choose a size that works for your track, and then have some of your, your clips. And um, yeah, actually the smaller, you want a variety of clips or you can use um, paper clips and put that over your track. And you mix, um, you can mix it in here or in another bigger Nalgene and mix it up like the, the consistency of pancake batter. And um, that is great. You want to be able to pour it in. You don't, and, and it, it's, it's a little bit of an art if, if you're putting it over dry soil, you want to be careful when you pour it in that you don't mess up your track. Um, so you just want to uh, get as close to you as, as you can to pour it in. Um, and then it, it, depending on where you live, um, you're going to have to let it set. And then you can, what I do is I will dig up the whole thing put even the dirt and put it in a Ziploc and double bag it. And when I get home, I let it dry for days and days and days before I peel everything off and clean off the dirt. Um, and you can see you know, that you're gonna, the dirt's gonna stay stuck to it, but I think it's kind of a cool, cool character anyway. So if you have a track that's really big, um, just put, put several together. Roseanne? Yeah. Kristen Parker has a question on how you mount the strip of paper to your journal. Do you use glue or do you use tape? I use PVA glue um, or, or you can buy white mounting tape. This also works well. Um, you can use uh, rubber cement. Um, I just keep a little vial of PVA in my field kit anyway. PVA is just Elmer's glue. Um, you want something that's archival quality too. So we look for a PVA that's archival that way. It um, won't degrade the paper. You don't want to introduce acids to your journal. So that's my, my plastic kit. It's leaking. There's a hole in the back. <laughs> so this is not lightweight. So, you know, I take this when I know I'm really going someplace with tracking in mind or I keep it in the truck. So, all right. 
Now, a couple of, of goodies for you guys. Um, in your, um, so Ray is going to put uh, the download link for, um, let's see if I can get that to not be quite so, I'm gonna have to do it that way. That's better. No, not right. So a double-sided little track card that you can print out, get it laminated, whatever, has lots of good tips. And then, so this is the tracking ruler I use and it, I, they're not available anymore. This is, I think almost 15, 20 years old, unfortunately. Um, but it's quite useful for taking photos and having a measurement um, in your photos. So. So Ray's going to put a link to this. There's a PDF I made for you where you can, you can print these out, cut them out, and then attach them. There's instructions. Attach them with a grommet or one of those round, round things that you stick paper together and it has the peg that comes up and then flattens out um, so that you, know, you, you could use colored paper. White's probably not the best. I don't have any colored. I use cardstock. Um, so maybe yellow cardstock, something bright. Oops, my grommet's not holding. Um, I didn't have a big enough grommet, but, but that's how that works. So you can also lay it out flat. Um, it's important to have, you know, you want the, the uh, numbers the same, metric and, uh, oh, what's it called? <laughs> Just had a brain, brain malfunction. The not metric inches um, like so, so that you can you can measure your tracks. So that's going to be in the in the, the the chat. So let me go back now. Find you guys. Jose let us know metric and imperial. Say that again. Jose let us know metric and imperial. Imperial. You know, that jumped into, it jumped into my head and I thought, huh, that doesn't sound right, but thank you. There All was right, a question about the kind of plaster you used. It was just plaster of Paris from the craft store, Ace Hardware. You can get it, Ace Hardware is the cheapest. You can get it in buckets. So if you work with kids, um, you can get plastic buckets of plaster of Paris. What a fun activity. Take kids out tracking and, and capture tracks and they have something to come home with. It's really fun. So go ahead and turn your um, videos back on um, and we can ask, take more questions um, and have fun with that. So any comments, questions, um, raise your hand on the, do these have a raise hand function, Saran? Does this meeting, I don't see it. I don't have one. Do you guys have the raise hand function on this meeting? Ah, <laughs> yes, so <laughs> if you'd like to speak, um, you're gonna have to unmute yourself. So go ahead, Pena. Nope, there we go. Nope. I lost you, okay. Well, if someone would like to speak, make a comment, raise your hand and then unmute yourself and we'll take them in order as we can. Saraya is going to help. So no questions, comments. No, you guys are like so quiet. Is in the reactions. Say that again, please. I didn't quite hear you. Raise hand is in the reactions. Got it. Thank you. I didn't cool. figure that one out. All right. So who wants to? Anybody? And, and any any questions um, that we missed in the chat? Somebody, Cindy in the chat has a question. She wanted to know if you could show a close up of your metadata. Amy Shannon. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Let me swap to that two seconds. All right. Is that showing my desk again? Yes. Okay, great. Um, 
So metadata is really important, and especially for things like recording animal tracks, and especially if you're doing it for conservation, because you want all the information you can get. So let's, let's look at some, some real metadata from a, a, a day. So this is, I mean, this is all the metadata. It is metadata literally means the data that goes with data. So metadata in a photo is embedded in the digital file. Um, and it tells you the exposure and the date and the time and ISO and everything. So this is our metadata that goes with our nature data. And, and it tells you important things. When was the sunrise and sunset? What was the weather at dawn? Clear, if it was cloudy, I'd draw a little cloud because I'm a nerd. Um, this is the moon phase. It's 3.2% um, and it's waxing, waning. Um, moon rise, moon set my location, latitude, longitude, um, 14 mile per hour wind from the Southwest, breezy, elevation, temperature, the high and the low. And I put the afternoon, the closing days weather there. And then this is my, my uh, you know, what, I, what I was observing that day. So I do that always for every day. If I change locations while I'm, while I'm um, journaling, then I, I continue, I don't think I have one there, no. Um, so uh, I will add the new location metadata. So if we were on a journey and my next entry, or even I changed locations during the day, I would make sure I wrote that down. So that's metadata. So does that answer your question? Oh, Jack's got it. Okay, go ahead, Jack. Let me let me um, come back to this video here. All right. Hey there. Uh, really enjoyed this class. I've been here with uh, Amelia and Carolyn. Unfortunately, we can't put on our video right now. There's something in the system that's not allowing us to do, but we've really enjoyed being here with you. I was, um, um, I know that the, the, the old Peterson Field Guide to Animal Tracks uh, by Olas Miri um has some wonderful line drawings of tracks in it um i was wondering are there any other folks out there that um books with illustrations of tracks that you find really inspiring for kind of uh appropriating ideas of of how to uh, draw tracks in our journals yeah so speak up what are your favorite tracking guides folks i know christian you're in sweden do you have a favorite tracking guide there? He's gone to get it. Okay, awesome. Um, how about those of you who are in other locations? We had someone from South Sudan. Um, we've got um, we've got Europe, France. Oh, there we go. Nice. Go ahead and unmute if you would like to explain that, Christian. Yeah, it's called the Jurens Spor, the tracks of the animals. Uh, it's it's really neat. Lots of pictures of every single animal that lives here in Scandinavia. The tracks, their uh, oh nice. Ooh, I don't know what you call. Yeah, we say scat. <laughs> to the scat, yeah. <laughs> uh, so you got everything in here. Nice, thank you. But it's in Swedish. It's still the photos are are excellent. Yeah. Um, that's really great. I think I think drawing tracks and um, it really gets them in your head. That's why I enjoy tracing them and drawing them because then it just becomes part of, of my brain. Rather, photos just don't do that for you because it's not using that part of your brain to learn. Um, but photos are good for documentation, for sure. Um, so other books, I like Paul Resendez's um, Tracking in the Art of Seeing. That's a absolutely fantastic book. Jack's right that the Murray book, Alice Murray's book is get it. You know, tracks don't change. Um, so it's not like they change. You know, change species names and lump and split like they did in with birds, where your field guide isn't useful. So his book is still fabulous. Um, so what other what other books are we getting? Any any in the chat? I'm particularly curious about ones with illustrations in them. 
um, where you think that this, the approach that the person took for drawing the illustrations um, are strategies that we might be able to appropriate for our nature journaling. Anything, anybody? Uh, Connie, did you want to say? I'm, uh, yes, I put my hand up, but it was way before the book oh, okay. comment. So I, my question is different than books. Okay, well, if you're wanting well, I'm going to ask your question. Okay. And those of you can think about books, <clears throat> share that. Uh, a lot of what I've seen today was very much um, kind of sandy. So the so prints of tracking is, is pretty much uh, visible. What uh, suggestions and ideas and thoughts do you have, or what is there things to look for when you're more in a woodsy area where you have a lot more uh, litter of leaves mm -hmm. and sticks and those kinds of things on the ground? What things pop up that says track here when it's not sandy to be really obvious? Good question, thank you. Uh, so when you're in a situation where there's a lot of leaf litter and um, noise, I call it noise on the ground, mm -hmm. and an animal passes, it's, it's, that's advanced, really advanced wildlife tracking. So my, my way to observe those, first, go out and practice. Go walk through a leaf litter or loamy area, and then turn around, look into the sun, I, I wanted to mention that the best times to, to track are when the sun is low on the horizon because it throws more shadows and walk into the sun and then you're gonna get more relief. So go practice, make tracks, study what track you made in that substrate. So you will then learn to see. So if, it's, if you've got loamy soil with a lot of stuff on top, but did something leave, is there an impression? you may not be able to get to species level. So then look for you know, a trail. Animals leave trails all over. They, they are, they're very habitual, like humans. They, the mountain lion we got to know in the Baba Kivari Mountains when we lived in her home range, we learned her circuit. And she, she went through her territory in a very, the same days of the month, like almost like clockwork around. She knew where the deer were for, for hunting. It's like she had a bathroom, she had a dining room, <laughs> she had a sleeping you know, bedroom. You'll learn that in your area and go to those areas and look where they, especially the deer, they, they use the same trails. Go there and look there. Clear the leaf litter, make a, make a spot to look for tracks. That would be another way. Um, Oh, someone just dropped in. Thank you. Sure. Um, someone just dropped into the chat. Animal Tracks of Alaska by Sheldon and Hartson is a handy guide. Um, is that, did they, are there, um, are they drawn illustrations? So in our book um, that Jonathan and I did, we drew all the illustrations using the stipple method. So very, very science illustration, like so dot, 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 all of the tracks our stipple method. And I demonstrated that with the, um, with the wild dog track. Um, but you can also use, you know, the watercolor or the textured uh, using the, the ink, excuse me, the wax with, with ink and watercolor over it, that type of thing. Um, lots of different ways to do it. Um, Kristen, did you want to talk again or are you as your, oh, okay, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I just remembered I actually got to uh, have a book in English as well. Uh, it's uh, really about uh, uh, tracking for search and rescue, but it, it talks a lot about, um, you know, th things like how tracks age, mm -hmm. um, how tracks appear on, on leaves and, and also other things uh, when, when you go through a forest area, for example, how you how you can see the sticks that breaks, the branches that breaks, mm -hmm. how, how you can tell how old they are and lots of these things that are also applicable, I think is the word in English, right? Yes, uh, exactly. For animal tracking, yeah. So it's actually a really, really, really good book for this as well. So 
lots of things, the kind of yeah. lights you can use to yeah. Yeah. So that really speaks to the awareness, right? So yeah. you're you're in the forest, you're looking for the broken sticks, you're looking for disturbance. Tracks are disturbance. Um, I can't emphasize enough for you to go out and make your own tracks and study them and then also age them. So go out in your yard, make a line of tracks, study them day after day as they fade and you'll learn for your region how the different, how, how it ages differently. It's different everywhere. If it's windy, if it's dry or, or rainy and, and so forth. So there is no one one way to age it's you've got to learn your own area so um wonderful right well we're got a few more minutes um thank you all for putting those great the, well i'm going to save the chat and we'll transfer um all the information from the chat onto the web page um someone asked to see our book for the illustration so the, most of the illustrations um from my slideshow were from our book. So I can um, try to think the quickest way to show that. I will put those on the website when I, I make the, so I'll take the recording and I'll, I put it on a web page in my tutorials. And I'm gonna put all these resources, all these book ideas, more pictures, the demos, the downloads. So you, you'll have it all in one place. So any- that I am putting together or trying to put together a list of the books as they're being suggested so we could put that together as perfect well. thank you also you can those of you if you want to do it now if you go down to the chat click on the three dots dot 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 next to it says file and then there's three dots and you can save the chat and it will download it for you if you want it right now Great. Any other kind of parting thoughts? Hi, Alex. I see you there. <laughs> Hello from Mexico. Are you guys still down in Mexico? Great. Okay. Oh, that doesn't work on an IO, so you can't download the chat. Don't worry, we're saving the chat, so you'll get it. Any other parting words then? Uh, Roseanne, Jack here again. Um, again, thank you so much for this workshop. Uh, my, my daughters and I are going to go out today and we're going to look for animal tracks and pick up trash uh, in a local park. So we're gonna to try to combine those two activities. Um, something that I, I just, really appreciate about your approach here is that you're evidence-based in your tracking. Um, the, there are there's sort of two movements in tracking that I see. And one is people who are really looking for the clues. And there's, there's an, a, another approach to it, which is sort of quasi mystical, which where people are, I think, trying to impress people with how much they know <laughs> about tracks and, but can't really communicate it. You're encouraging us to look for the evidence, look for the clues. And um, the, the, right at, at the start, you said that, you know, it, it comes that we all can do this, um, but it's gonna take some time. And just like anything that's worthwhile doing, um, you know, it, it will take time and, and more practice. Um, but it's not, it's, it's not a, a, a magical gift. It comes from our direct observations and those sorts of things. I really appreciate that, that evidence-based approach that you have. Thank you. Yes, uh, we've been developing that over many years and we're very uh, conservative uh, because a lot of the tracking we do is for conservation organizations and we have to be careful. And so, but over time you get, you get to where you're like, oh, a lion track, or you, know, you can just look instantly and go, oh, a bobcat or yep. and you can't amaze your friends when you say oh that's not a that's sorry that's not a mountain lion that's a that's a dog <laughs> and here's why here's the evidence so nice thank you all right does Soraya do Soraya do you want to yeah, I wanted to say to everybody um 
thank you for enjoying this. Well, we hope you enjoy this free workshop. And if you would please consider contributing to our tip jar, and that can be reached at exploringoverlands.com. We hope you'll join us for many more workshops in the future. Thank you, Soraya. Thank you. Your, your audio is a little wobbly, but thank you, everybody. And I please send me your track um, tracks and send, send them. We want to put them on the website. It's really fun. It's very addictive. So have fun and um, get out there and track. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Soraya, for your help. Thank you.